a matter of fact, if you look here at these inguinal nodes here, they drain a lot of the, this part of your body here. I don't know how many times people have come into um, the clinic saying, you know, I got cancer, I've got this big mass right here, I've got a couple of big masses right here. When it turns out, <coughs> if you don't see anything in front, spin them around. Because they probably have some boil on their butt, a little uh, folliculitis back here, or a butt bite or something, a little zip on their butt, because that drains into this area too. I don't know any times I've seen that. You know, they, they don't see anything wrong. You spin them around and they've got a, you know, a little, uh, not a furrow, because you would know that. But just a little cellulite, I mean, just a little folliculitis. You would. You know, I'll tell you guys something funny. You know, going back to our model uh, for the previous hour, the lowest spinal cord level, there's a cutaneous reflex associated with it. What is your lowest dermatome? Toxic. Where, where, where did that go to? Since you don't have a tail, the lowest thing on your body is your anus. There's a, this is your anus right here. If you take that pen, I really wouldn't use a pen, but you could take a cock-tipped applicator and an unconscious person. If you want to know if the nervous system is intact in an unconscious person, look at their anus, you know, put them on their side, look at their anus, and take that Q-tip and just do to their anus what I just did to your belly button. And it'll wink. It's called, Google it, it's called the anal wink reflex. That means you, that means you have an intact nervous system. Google it. Somebody Google it. Is it not on there? It's real. So, my, my point in bringing this up out of context you know, is when we did her belly button, how it contracted her upper extremities. If we did an annual wink on her, what would happen? <laughs> She'd go into some kind of like river dancing or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, is under a low pressure. But if there's a connection between the testicular artery and the pampiniform plexus without first going through that capillary bed, then you have varicose veins of the pampiniform plexus. So these swollen, engorged veins feel like, the characteristic term feels like a bag of worms in the scrotum. It does. If that's what it is. First time you grab a hold of them, you're going to say, that feels like a bag of worms. Okay? You can Google that too. Bag of worms. See what pops up. Okay, yeah. Does it usually only affect one side? It can affect both sides, yeah. I've known it to be on both sides. Most of the time it's only on one side. The problem with this is because now you've messed up the heat exchanger. So in, uh, if you don't get it prepared, uh, you can become a still. There was a roommate I used to have. He played football for OSU. And while he was a football player, he was accused by two different women of fathering their child, getting them pregnant. And so he goes to medical school at OU, and then he was selling all of his body parts in order to make money to, to survive. And one of the things he did one day was to be a sperm donor. So he goes and donates a sample of sperm because they were paying like 
forty-five dollars a, a visit, and uh, so he went. And, I mean, because he was donating bone marrow, doing all these psych studies, and everything, trying to earn money. Well, he got a call from him a couple <coughs> days later. Said, "Don't come back. You're, You're sterile." Mm -hmm. And it turns out he had bilateral uh, varicoceles, um, and had to undergo surgery to fix them. Which, of course, ate up all of the money he made <laughs> selling body parts. But the fact is, he was not the father of those two kids. So. That's the same guy who did the, smoke, the whiskey out of the smoke. The same guy. Yeah. He's a practicing physician in this state, oh. uh, as a matter of fact, up in the Tulsa area. I'm going to hook you up with him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so inguinal hernias, this is the big deal here because you know, uh, all the guys that come into your um, practice for a physical exam, you've got to check them for a hernia. Um, you know, pre sports pre-participation physicals with the guys. Uh, some places will actually check them. Other places will just ask them, have you noticed a bulge in this area or any problems? I don't check uh, high, high school. I don't check them during dur doing sports pre-participation physicals. I just ask them. Uh, if they do have a bulge, if they report a bulge, then you do check them. But I don't routinely check them. Uh, so here's the hernia. What it is, is the, uh, it, the uh, abdominal contents, namely the small bowel, but it can be the fat in the abdomen. You're going to see that there's fat in the abdomen. can herniate out through either or the superficial or deep inguinal ring. Mm -hmm. Now remember that dotted line of the path of the testes? That is what this indirect hernia is following. It exited the abdominal cavity through the deep ring, traveled down through the inguinal canal, and then out the superficial ring into the scrotum. That's an indirect hernia. And you call it indirect because it's lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. And I already told you that the deep ring was lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. It's outside of Hesselbach's triangle. Everybody clear on that? These types of hernias because they're just following the pathway of the testes, they're usually congenital in origin. As opposed to a direct inguinal hernia, it pokes out of the superficial ring. It does not travel through the inguinal canal because the superficial ring is at the end of the canal. It's medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. And it's in Hesselbach's triangle. They it did have a couple of S's and an L and a B and stuff. Hesselbach's triangle. Those are the differences between an indirect and a direct <coughs> inguinal hernia. An indirect hernia, because it's taking the pathway of the death is more likely to end up in the scrotum than a direct inguinal hernia. When somebody comes in and says, I've got a painful bulge down here, if the bulge is right here in the, near the midline, in Hesselbach's triangle, it's probably going to be a direct inguinal hernia. If the bulge is out here, it's going to be an indirect. Now, the way you check for a hernia is you take your finger, you can take whatever the fingers you have. I like to use my little finger, but you can use your index finger. And have the patient stand there with their legs slightly apart. 
And um, we had something that was in the pot. Go ahead and back. Which, yeah, she did. Did you take it? <laughs> She's a squirrel bag. <laughs> what you do is you take your finger and you come out here laterally and you push, you invert the, the scrotum like that and you just push it up into the superficial wing. No. And it's really easy to do. You can easily put your finger um, and for the superficial, the superficial ring is right here on the surface. It's not like you're, you know, putting your whole arm up. <laughs> it's just with your finger, and you get them to bear down. They'll stop them. Or people say to turn your head and cough. Like we've already been over why you turn your head, so you don't cough on you, so they don't cough on you. I don't. Most a lot of people do coughing because that increases the abdominal pressure. If there's a hernia, it will push the hernia down, and you'll feel it as a bulge striking your finger. But that's too quick to me. A cough is too quick. I prefer to have people about salad. You know, bear down like you're going to have a family. Like that, and then you can feel it better. Okay? You can tap this <laughs> Everybody understand all of these things right here? Now, a lot of times, the surgeons, you can only 100% tell if it's a direct or inguinal hernia during surgery, where you're looking at where it's poking through in relation to the inferior epigastric vessels. That defines inferior, I mean, uh, uh, direct versus indirect. Where it is in relation to the inferior epigastric vessel, where it leaves the abdominal cavity. And as I said, the indirect is more likely to end up in the scrotum than the direct. The direct is more likely to be just be a bulge right here. Any questions about any of this? Aside from pain, what happens if people don't get a fix? Well, the thing about hernias, whether or not you're talking about an inter, uh, inguinal hernia or a femoral hernia or an umbilical hernia, <coughs> any type of hernia, is when stuff comes out, you want to be able to push it back in. That's called reducing the hernia. The problem comes in, and sometimes when you're talking about these rings, if you get the uh, intestines to go outside that tight ring and it cuts off the blood supply, that's called a strangulated hernia, and it's a medical emergency because you're going to lose bowel. And it's very painful because you now have ischemic bowel. Remember, dilation and ischemia. You're going to be doing um, uh, hernia exams, testicle exams, total exam, rectals here in just a couple of months uh, on, on the person, people. Uh, so, it's coming for you. Um, when I was a student, I told these guys that this was the funniest thing in the world last, last uh, when I was a PA student uh, on a surgery rotation, we had this patient who was coming in for herniography, and he was a schizophrenic, and this guy was just nuttier than a, I mean, he was just all over the place. But when I went to do the admission history and physical, I don't know if I told you, did I tell you this? He was lying in bed. And so I, you know, got, did the physical, got down to his, to check his hernia. I pulled the sheet down, and his scrotum was the size of a cantaloupe. Oh. And I said, oh, wow. That's a hernia. <laughs> so I took it and started feeding it back up in through the hole to reduce it. And I pushed all of his intestines back up in so it looked normal. And I said, bear down. And he goes, mm, like that, and his scrotum moved. Oh. And no kidding, it was about that big. And if you sit there and look at it, 
<laughs> what, is, what do the intestines do? The peristalsis. The scrotum was moving. And then the coolest thing was you could put your stethoscope in and put it on the scrotum. You would bounce <laughs> I played with that guy for hours. And <laughs> so, in, uh, in repairing hernias, uh, what you want to do is you want to use a mesh or you want to tighten these rings down to prevent the intestines from going through them. Here's an illustration here. Indirect is coming down through the canal. Direct is pushing right through. Now a couple of clinical correlates here. McBurney's point is um, important when you're dealing with appendicitis. Appendicitis starts out as peri-umbilical pain, in other words, pain around the belly button. And then when that inflamed <coughs> appendix starts irritating the peritoneum, the parietal peritoneum, it becomes localized. The visceral peritoneum and the gut are all visceral. You don't feel that. I mean, but the parietal peritoneum is somatic. If the parit parietal peritoneum is inflamed, peritonitis, that's a very painful condition. It's not distension, it's not ischemia, it's infection. Because it's somatic, it's painful. Appendicitis inflames the parietal peritoneum at, a mid at the midpoint between the umbilicus and the ASIS. That is called McBurney's point. So a person with full-blown appendicitis, if you ask them about it, yeah, it started right here this morning, but now the pain is right there. It's precisely localized. It's McBurney's point. Midway between the umbilicus and the ASIS on the right. I should say on the right. Stria are present. Um, in the abdomen when you have a rapid weight gain. Um, it stretches the collagen, the tissues, and you wind up with stria here. You see this a lot in the third trimester of pregnancy. Um, they make all sorts of things to try to keep the skin soft and pliable, like uh, something butter. What do they call it? Uh, no, not cocoa butter. Oh, What's it called? Belly butter. Belly butter. It's called belly butter. <laughs> yeah, it has, it has a slang name. Belly butter. Yeah. And you just, it's just like lanolin, lanolin or maybe not, maybe not lanolin. Maybe that's like toxic to the fetus. But cocoa butter or stuff like that. Uh, keep the skin soft. Uh, a lot of times, uh, depending on the person, when the, they have the, the, the baby, or they lose weight, uh, if this is due to obesity, the stria will go away. In some people it doesn't, but um, in a lot of people it does. Uh, they're sort of purplish in coloration. This bottom panel here shows uh, an interesting feature that happens during the third trimester of pregnancy. It's called, it's called the, the, the linea alba, which is white line, turns into the linea nigra, which is the dark line. And then after delivery, the disc will eventually, in 99.9% .9 of the people, turn back to normal color, and it will become invisible again. But this usually happens in the last trimester. I'd say it happens probably 95 to 99% of the time in women, if not 100%. It does not happen in obesity. It happens only in pregnancy. Oh, it's from because <laughs> in obesity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this 
is, uh, remember the tunic of Vat and Alice? If you wind up getting uh, kicked in the new news, or um, it can be congenital as well, the tunic of Vat and Alice can fill up with fluid, and that's called a hydro seal. And they can be really large. They can be impressively large. What you want to do is take the otoscope or your pin light or something like that, turn off the lights of the room, and put it behind the, the, swell, the swelling, and you can transilluminate it. You see how red it is? You're just shining the light through the water. That's a hydro seal. If it's blood, like if you got kicked in the new news, that's a hemato seal that will not transilluminate. You don't have to fix a hydro seal. It doesn't do anything to the heat exchange mechanism. It's just uh, some people it gets pretty large and can be. A cosmetic issue because it's, it can get so large on one side, the affected leg does not go forward enough. And if you're walking, you will always walk towards the side of the leaf. How would you fix it, Miss Train? Well, that's going to be on the test. have all these guys walking around. That's what railing and walls are for. Oh, well, you said, what was that question? Uh, just how, do how do you fix it? Uh, <laughs> temporary, temporary fix. You just put a wall in front of them. The temporary fix is to go to a urologist. I wouldn't fix these myself. You could just stick a needle in there and drain it. Yeah. Um, but it's probably like an electron on the side, it will probably fill back up again. The only the definitive fix is to go in there and remove, surgically remove the tunic of that house. You don't really need that. So. Now this one right here, you're going to have to surgically fix a, a hematocene. As they did here, they took it out, so remove that testicle. Okay. This is a, a condition you you will run into uh, in your clinical practice. Uh, this is called testicular torsion, mm -hmm. and so remember the old gubernaculum. That thing stays there in adulthood. It stays attached to the bottom of the testicle. It, it anchors the bottom of the testicle to the scrotum and prevents the testicle from rotating. But in some um, people, mostly boys, the gubernaculum breaks down so that the testicle is free-floating in there. And it usually happens during exercise, like running or basketball or football. They're, I don't know if it's just a motion of the legs or what, but the, the testicle can rotate 180 degrees. And when it rotates, it can cut off the testicular artery. And of course, they're going to present an extreme pain. Remember we were talking about ischemia? I mentioned ischemia is out of proportion to the physical findings here. Okay. That's the same thing here. Everything looks normal. Everything feels normal. He's just screaming in pain. Uh, you've got about a two-hour window to revert to fix it, or you're going to lose that testicle. And to fix it, all you have to do is take the testicle and rotate it and unwrap it, unkink it. Um, if you, so which way do you rotate the testicle? If you rotate it the wrong way, it causes more pain. If you rotate it the right way, it, re it's, it relieves pain. Now, one of the things that uh, the urologists do, or is available in the emergency room, 
if you had a patient, a kid that came in and called the urologist down, they do a Doppler ultrasound of the testicular, of the spermatic cord, and see that there's blood flow. If there's blood flow in the spermatic cord, it's not a torsion. I've seen this um, several times. Um, I've actually seen an ovarian torsion in a female once. Um, so it can happen with females too. You know, when we get to the females, you'll see that the ovary has uh, <coughs> ligaments attached to it, anchoring it. Um, uh, any questions about that? <coughs> is there a permanent fix or do you just... Oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, the permanent fix is the uh, urologist will go in and tap the uh, base of the testicle down to the scrotum, mm -hmm. sort of a, a synthetic uh, gubernaculum. I thought those Cheez-Its came from down there. You're eating their Cheez-Its? She doesn't want them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is an umbilical hernia. Um, oh. This is what um, your niece looks like today, right there. That's what the umbilical cord looks like today. Uh, in some kids, um, they develop a little hernia like that. Um, I, I have never seen a Caucasian kid with a hernia. I've seen probably 50 billion African American kids with this little hernia. Uh, infants, up to about, they usually all go away spontaneously by the time they reach kindergarten and you never have to do anything about it. There's this little, you know, you can sit there and push it down like that. Uh, that's all it is. Um, one of the um, old wives' tales, or whatever you call it, is they'll take a silver dollar and tape it to the <laughs> anterior abdomen, push it down and tape it to help it go away faster. It doesn't work. But if you just leave it alone, it'll, it'll, they'll wind up with an any by the time they're in kindergarten. Now this guy over here, that's pretty impressive. Uh, his entire midline, the linea alba, has opened up. His rectus muscles have separated. And he's got this big hernia, umbilical hernia, uh, in the midline. <coughs> so all they, what they've done there is they pushed it all back in, removed all of that, sutured it together, and now he looks uh, normal-ish. What does that mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that <was> <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going here. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Uh, on the testicular torsion, will um, I saw it with the picture of it out? Does that do you test for it by tra trying to transilluminate as well? Say it again. Do you test for like testicular torsion by trying to transilluminate? No, as well? you don't transilluminate torsion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what you would do is, if you suspect torsion, you get them to a urologist and put them on. Now, in the emergency room, say. If you're down there in the Hilton emergency room, um, I would try to rotate the testicle uh, to get it to... Now, I, I don't know this because I, I used to know it at one time, and it's probably relevant to the board exam, and you'll probably get it in urology in the course. But either the right or left testicle torses more than the other. I can't remember which one. And when you reduce it, you reduce it counterclockwise or clockwise, there's a standard that you use. But I don't remember what it is now. All I want you to know is torsion. Okay? Go to lab. Now, in, in, uh, in a lab today, you're going to look for the muscles. You're going to do the inguinal region. Uh, in the spermatic cord, you need to be able to identify that superficial ring. The spermatic cord, find the iliorenal nerve. In the females, if you don't find the round ligament, don't get upset because the round ligament starts on the uterus. It comes out the deep ring, down the canal, out the uh, superficial ring, 
and actually becomes fibrous into the labia majora. I have no idea what this, the purpose of this ligament is. Why your uterus is connected to your labia majora, but it is. You're going to easily find the ligament, the round ligament, on the uterus. So if you don't see it immediately today, don't get upset. Okay? You'll find it from the inside.